Well, if you're ready, um, let's just, just start with that. Well, one that uh, amused me was um, one about the pantsuits <laughs> being, uh, I guess, they thought they were very tight. Um, one thing that you might not be aware of, all the clothes that I used in the movie uh, were mine. They were not costumed, and uh, it's kind of unusual for a uh, actor to uh, supply his own wardrobe, but Graydon Clark thought it was a good idea, and uh, I was comfortable with it because it fit my style, and they fit my body, and uh, we didn't have to go through someone else's interpretation of what they wanted to see and so forth. I was concerned playing a hairdresser had the a duplicity in interpretation, and I didn't want it to get caught up in being interpreted against my uh, masculine uh, intentions. Sure. I mean, this because this film was uh, 1970s, and there was still kind of a lot of, of stigma that could be attached to that. So. Yeah, and at that time, I had never seen Warren Beatty's shampoo. Yeah. I didn't know, you know. Uh, hairdressers were generally pretty feminine guys, you know, and uh, androgynous at best. So I didn't want to get caught up in that. So I thought it would be a best idea if I uh, just did what I did in every other movie that I was involved in. Really, I didn't do very much acting. I just played me, and I was very good at playing me perhaps not so good at playing anybody else, you know. I just transposed myself into the situation, and it worked out well. Sure. So um, let me, just to, to touch on this one more point, I'm, so basically you did your own costume design. Uh, well, you could say that, but I didn't think of it like that. I just simply wore what I felt was appropriate for the situation. It projected me as I felt comfortable being projected. Sure. I don't know if the costume designer had anything to do with what they did for the rest of the film. I didn't spend much time getting involved in the technical aspects of it or anything other than my own part as such because I think when we shot this film, it was unbelievably hot in Los Angeles and I had some international commitments and I didn't want to take up any unnecessary time but I found it very pleasurable working with Graydon Clark and Al Fass was uh, a great guy and I had fun with a lot of the members of the cast and so forth but I didn't waste any time doing what I was doing. Sure. So now I understand that you uh you starred in, in this film, but also in, in two other films. How does how does this film compare to uh, to Getting Over and, and Candy uh, Tangerine Man? How do you think this film compares to those? Well, the truth is that technically Black Shampoo is a better put-together film. The cinematographer was Dean Cundy, and I was very impressed when I went to see uh, Chinatown and saw... Dean Cundy's name on it as cinematographer. But doing the filming of Black Shampoo, you could tell that he had unlimited possibility because he was very serious and very technically capable, and he was going one step beyond. And it showed in the finished film. I think that Candy Tangerine Man was directed by uh, Matt Simber. Matt's a great guy, married to uh, Jane Mansfield, did a lot of other stuff and so forth. But I think that the production of Black Shampoo was the best production, even though I like the role in Candy Tangerine, man. It's kind of like a sentimental favorite. And Getting Over was a film that I produced and starred in and paid for. So um, it has a reason to be close to my heart. I think it came out to be a very good film. Uh, film was the uh, beneficiary of a re-edit that I arranged while on tour with my uh, musical ex. Actually, I ran into a uh, one of the major executives at the Malaysian Film Commission, 
and I sent the master to Malaysia. He sent it on to Hong Kong, and the uh, Hong Kong editors re-edited the film and made a much tighter, better uh, running film out of it. And I'm not so sure whether the um, re-edited version is the version that is out on uh, DVD, or uh, on uh, video or not. In some places it is, in some places it's not. I'd just like to say that one thing that you would be absolutely shocked, I probably had a unique opportunity in seeing the course of exhibition of these films because I was constantly traveling around the world. And I found them everywhere from South Africa to Malaysia, Singapore, Japan, Europe, Scandinavia, all over the United States, Canada, Mexico, you name it, those pictures would pop up. And a lot of times I would be there for other reasons. I was in Singapore with my wife's show and just walking down Orchard Road, and I looked up and there were huge... A caravan of kids behind me, and they're constantly chanting "Black Shampoo, Black Shampoo, Candy Tangerine Man, Candy." T I didn't even know they knew about those films. I'm inclined to try to avoid public scrutiny, but it was no avoiding this. Um, the pictures were playing at the um, biggest theater in Singapore, and for the time I was there, I was, uh, shall we say. Uh, Besieged. Oh, exactly. It sounds like, you know, you were a, a hero. Yeah, I was a hero to everybody except me. I wanted it to go away because the thing that after being on the road, some people are, are inclined to want the uh, focus and publicity and so forth. I'm not. And I wanted to be incognito and I wanted to be anonymous. I was able to achieve that most of the time and let the entertainers that I was with take the spotlight, but many times it betrayed me. For an instance, I think uh, Mike White focuses on one of the things I talked to him about in London uh, at the theater, but I had another situation at the Apollo Theater in New York. I went there to negotiate a contract with my uh, group, The Love Machine, that were playing, uh, going to play there with The Temptation in a stage show. And while I was in the office of Bob Schiffman, he happened to take a look uh, at the post on the wall, looked at me, and then went out of his office, and he said, John Daniels, are you the same person starring in that picture that's playing downstairs right now? And I said, oh, God. And... He went down and stopped the picture, put on the lights, and arranged an impromptu autograph uh, session right there in Apollo. The Apollo used to show movies at one time during the 70s, during the day all the time. And uh, I got the heat put on me there uh, with no intention of such happening. I hit there at a time on a return trip from Europe when the pictures were playing at the theater, and I had the heat turned up again. So, just one of those things, I guess. Yeah. Wow. So you'll have to you'll have to excuse me for a second, but um, so would it be safe and safe in saying that that you wanted to keep your musical career and your acting career as separate as possible? Oh no, I. Uh, it would be safe to say I was a reluctant star of films. I uh, did not actively seek out uh, an involvement in films. I kind of got, uh, shall we say, passed around from one producer to the next, to the next, to the next. You know, they, they'd they say, well, this guy is so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so and I'd just get the part. And I would do those that I could do. A lot of times I had to turn them down because I was committed to travel. And I remember the last picture I was offered was a thing called Blood Brothers that was filming in a uh, prison in Seattle. And I could see why I made sense to the producer because I'd had these very successful films, Black Shampoo and Candy Tangerine Man, which had grossed a lot of money. 
and uh, he wanted me to do the picture. But the Love Machine was opening, uh, that was my group, was opening with Tom Jones and Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas at the same time that they wanted to start the movie. And I couldn't very well not be with them on that occasion. That was a, a big date for them. So I turned the movie down and went to Las Vegas instead. I had a situation in a, a film that I did with my friend, Don Edmond, who directed a number of uh, pictures, but I promised him that I would do a part in his film. I was in Paris. I was slated to go to, believe it or not, Tehran, Iran, with uh, one of my shows. And at that time, it was still open. And I uh, decided to fly back and do the picture and then fly back to Iran. I did fly back. I kept my commitment to Don because he was my friend. But I didn't have much soul for flying out to uh, Tehran after that. I was just kind of beat. And I managed to get another uh, person to uh, manage the group on that tour. So these kind of things were always happening you know it was a time when everything was going at once and i was firmly established in the music business and had great things happening when the movie thing started you know it wasn't like one films were happening first and then i tried to impose a another thing i was a real and still am a real professional in the, the music business and the uh, film thing was kind of like an interesting, I don't want to use the word sideline, but kind of that thing, because after um, a flurry of films in the 80s and so forth, the reason I didn't do anything else because I was busy in other parts of the world, South Africa, Australia, doing musical things, and it just never crossed my mind to come back and make a concerted effort to try to re-involve myself in it all right sounds good to me wow it sounds actually really really busy i was you have uh, no idea <laughs> busy is not the word for it you know it's one of those things where you uh, certainly learn that it it's important to be able to say no to uh, yourself and to opportunities and things like that but being young you think uh, well you can accommodate everything and I was young and very strong, and it took a long time to wear me down, but it eventually did. Oh, sure. I could imagine. Yeah. Wow. Now, um, getting back to Black Shampoo, mm -hmm. what kind of a role did you have in, in helping to cast your co-stars? I only had um, was involved with uh, one facet of that. Graydon Clark, great guy very intelligent man and a good sense of humor and which I appreciated quite a bit. He told me, you can pick your co-star, you know, the, for the female uh, lead in the film. He said, you can have your choice. And I looked at all the applicants and the people that they had up for the role. And though she was not the... There were some very pretty girls. There were various qualities that were more profound and so forth. But Tanya Boyd was a serious actress. She really had a heart in acting. She was a very attractive girl, clean cut, and also very intelligent. And I felt that she could make the most of the opportunity because she was the most serious. We worked well together, and uh, she was my choice for that situation. I did not get involved in any of the other casting and so forth. And uh, you don't have you don't have any regrets about about casting her at all then? Oh no. No, she was good. She she um well, she proved it by um uh, going on and having a pretty good career as a television actress and um uh, just like I was saying about Dean Cundy, you know, it, a lot of times Fate makes a judgment for you. You look at what uh, these people are able to do after your uh, encounter with them and so forth, and it just about spells it all out. Some you never hear of again. Uh, some go on to 
less glorious involvements and so forth. But some of them really distinguish themselves and uh, have a pretty good career. I used to run into Graydon Clark's pictures all over the world. You know, it happened. In, I remember one time in Paris seeing a uh, a poster that was interesting to me that was posted all over the city. I went closer to it, read it, and directed by Graydon Clark, and that gave me a, a good feeling, you know. His pictures were, other than black shampoo, were making it on the circuit and doing well. It sounds almost fatherly, the way you uh, you look upon these people like, like Miss Boyd and, and, uh, and Mr. Clark. Well, I don't know about fatherly, because uh, I think the age difference, the chronological difference, wasn't significant. You know, we were about the same age and so forth, except I think Tanya was young, very young at the time. But uh, I think maybe you are detecting the fact that in the music business, when you are managing and directing the careers of a lot of young entertainers, you end up involved in their life in many other ways other than music. And in order that you see their full capacity realized in the music business. You have to involve yourself in so many other facets of their life, and you do end up with the kind of fatherly hand uh, in the situation, and it has a tendency to come out in other things, you know. And I had been, I think, uh, when Black Shampoo came out in 76, Jesus, I had started producing and managing groups in the 60s, but you have to understand, when I was doing this, I was a very young guy, too. You know, it wasn't like I was a mature, aged fellow and so forth. I was a very young guy and was doing remarkable things for my age. And uh, as I said, the uh, involvement in so many facets of their life to make it possible for them to uh, make the most of their musical talents it nourished a kind of fatherly approach. Sure. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, you're, you're actually very correct in, in what I was, I guess, trying to imply, uh, in that it was neat to hear you speak of them with a sense of pride in looking back and saying, well, I did this with them, and then and seeing what else they had gone on to do. So almost kind of with a, not so much a reverence, but, you know, with a respect to what it is they accomplished afterwards. Oh, yeah, I, th- I think you're right. It's a genuine feeling, you know, it, it's nothing that has, it just evidenced itself for as felt, you know. I'm glad to, to see uh, the things that they've done, and um, you, you just have a tendency to feel good, say, well, I remember when, you know. Uh, Tanya, she was in some um, soap opera, continually long-running part. And I think back, I might have given her her start because I think she was just starting out. And that was her very first movie role. It always makes you feel good to uh, have, you know, given somebody a helping hand that they made or been involved with them at a certain point, that they made the most of, that they did something with, you know. Let me ask you, when you were, when you guys were filming Black Shampoo, was there any moment during the filming of this that struck you as being, I don't know, particularly a watershed moment or some moment while you were filming when you knew that this was that this was a good film, when you knew that this was uh, really going to accomplish the level that it ended up accomplishing? Well, no, but I tell you, the, I had five points in the film, and I always kind of had the outlook that you never really... Uh, got paid for any percentage points that you had in the production so why hold on to them and hope and uh, I sold them back to Graydon Clark the day we finished the film boy was I wrong the thing that it did incredibly well and here we are talking about it almost 30 years later the one thing that did when I finally saw the film put together, the one thing that I thought might be a precursor of good things to come, the ending, you know, it had a slam bang ending. And I, every couple of years or so, I pull out the video and look at that again, you know, 
because it, it knocked me out when we did it, and it still, you know, makes you feel like there's a real payoff here. That, I suppose, could be that moment that you're speaking of. Sure. Now, um, just to get this out of the way so I don't get reprimanded later by uh, by some people, what what did happen to you while you were walking around uh, with your wife on London? It, London, Leicester Square is kind of like uh, a busy uh, activity center of London, you know. And what there is, there's a big square, and in this square there are all these theaters, and thousands of people come there to see shows of all kinds. It's right close to Piccadilly Circus in the heart of London. And um, while we were playing in London, I was walking with my wife in Leicester Square. We were just having a good time, you know, walking along and seeing the sights and being involved with the um, ambiance that was taking place there. And uh, I'm thinking at this time, wow, this is great being anonymous and uh-oh, I look up and here's a 30-foot high statue of me at this theater. It's outside mounted on the marquee and then I, I walked up to the um, to get a look at the uh, poster, you know, that uh, was in the little uh, exhibition windows and so forth. When I did that, the manager happened to be coming out of the theater, and he looked and he said, oh, my God. He said, you're John Daniels, aren't you? I, I said, uh, I didn't know whether I wanted to um, fess up to being that because I knew what was going to happen. And he said, come with me. And he went in the theater, stopped the, the movie, and turned the lights on and announced that we have the star of the film, John Daniels, here, and, you know, and the whole thing, and there was applause and da 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 but the thing that was significant about it my wife had my soon to be wife because we weren't married at that time she didn't have no idea that, that I was even in the movie because she is a singer and I was touring her show and she knew me as her manager and when she saw that happen she was just flabbergasted and I had basically not told her about that because I felt that if there was anything superficial that was going to influence our relationship, I didn't want to bring it into the game. That was uh, one of the things I just remembered. That was, it was pleasure and surprise at the same time. We later ran into that same situation in Mexico City when the picture was playing down there and it had been dubbed in Spanish, you know, and I'm thinking, walking along in the Zona Rosa, that I was safe, and what do you know? It happens. Now, I imagine how somebody who is really famous, you know, somebody uh, like Burt Reynolds or somebody like that, that at its height, boy, that must be excruciating. Yeah, but, you know, it probably did get you just a, a, a little bit more, a few more points with your soon-to-be wife than two. <laughs> but it probably helped. I mean, it, it didn't seal the deal, but, you know, it might have been the icing on the cake. Well, I don't, I don't doubt that being as she's here right now. So, <laughs> so uh, something worked right, you know. But uh, I think she was kind of impressed that I hadn't broke the ice with that and I tried to keep it cool, but I was uh, totally exposed in London. Wow. That is actually very impressive to have not broken the ice with that. If it was me, I'd be telling everyone. I'd have a loudspeaker on my car up and down the street. So, Well, she's the kind of person that I don't even know if that would have made any difference. You know, she, um, she I don't know, she had seen a lot of people blowing their horn and so forth and uh, she was more impressed with uh, other facets you know like the character and, and that kind of thing and being that her father was a minister there was a kind of like another mindset there but if I do any more pictures I will get that uh, microphone and uh, it's about time that I touted them I think that's an excellent idea 
<laughs> so, um, well, is there is there anything else you'd uh, you'd like to mention about the film as a as kind of a, a wrapping up, kind of how you felt about it? Well, I enjoyed doing it. When you uh, end up doing um, all your own stunts in a film, especially in some of the areas that we were filming in, I up until that point had never used a stunt double had never been involved i just just did it it was uh, a challenge and i had fun doing it uh, later on i found out that they got other guys to take those uh, bumps and falls i didn't really have to do it but um, i took it as a challenge and there are some parts in black shampoo that running with Tanya Boyd across my shoulder through um, Hill and Dale, <laughs> it was rough. I remember those things. I remember that we attracted a lot of bees out in the uh, the wilds of outskirts of Los Angeles while shooting it, and I only had a uh, undershirt on. Boy, rough. We had to fight a lot of a lot of situations, but. It came together, and the main thing I'd like to say in wrapping up, I am totally shocked that this many years later, there's still some interest in this picture. Of all the movies that have been made since then, I would never have believed it. But it, I think it was a kind of unique time in Hollywood. I remember one time looking at Variety, and both Black Shampoo and Candy Tangerine Man were listed at the same time in the top 50 grossing films. So it must have did something very good to uh, be in there week after week after week and uh, still be around this many years later. Well, yeah, it also, you know, it was also done at a time where it was catering to an audience that really hadn't been directed and shot for. That's really true, and uh, I think that of all the uh, black exploitation pictures made, shampoo was one of the better. If I might use the words, it was one of the classier ones made. Graydon Clark had a pretty good touch, and he's such an intelligent guy. And it was a picture that I've never been ashamed of. I can say that I've always been proud of it. Well, good. Let me ask you, though, um, and I don't mean this in, in any bad sort of way, what is your feeling of films like this being labeled as black exploitation? Do you feel that that kind of cheapens what it accomplished, or...? Oh, uh, no. Because of this, whoever coined that label, it was accurate. It was true. How are you going to resent it? And really, really... What it did, it gave opportunity where there was nothing happening. There was a void prior to this uh, gusher of, of film work that ended up on the market during the late 60s and the 70s. You know, it filled a void. There was nothing before that. And I tell you what makes me feel good, the fact that I think that I was on the pioneer side with getting over you know, because I wanted to turn the corner and do family-style nice pictures. And now when I look at things like, well, are we there yet? And some of the black films, Johnson Family Vacation and so forth, that are coming out now that have nothing to do with exploitation, I realize that the stuff we did with Shampoo and Tangerine Man was a necessary part of the foundation. It was what people wanted to see. They enjoyed it. It exploited a certain audience for their own benefit. Okay, great. So, so I'm not a um, harsh critic of uh, the word. I I was acquainted with a lot of guys in a lot of civil rights organizations that harshly criticized uh, the genre and, you know, the products being made. But I asked them, what would happen if those things were not made, you know? And the answer uh, never came. There was silence because at the time they were made, they were the things that people gravitated to the theaters to see. It held Hollywood together for a long time. Uh, exploiting this audience that had never uh, basically had a chance to uh, see itself, realize 
on the big screen. And some of it was atrocious, some of it was good, and some of it was stood the test of time. So that's what we're looking at. And I think that happens to be the case with everything. Uh, go back into the history of Hollywood. Everything was an Academy Awards film. There was some not so good, some bad, some all kinds. But now, you know, they're giving Academy Awards out this weekend for the excellence that uh, built upon that. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions I've got for you. So I, you know, wanted to thank you for your time, taking a, an hour out of your day to uh, to sit here and talk to me and letting me record it. I enjoyed it. Well, good. And I hope, uh, you know, I'd like to uh, see his DVD. Uh, I hope you would uh, afford a copy of it. And uh, I hope you guys get another cover picture. <laughs> I must say, that's the only thing that I hated. I'd run into it all over, and i Jesus, and the poster is so much better. I still have the poster up in my office. <laughs> all right, well, I'll see, I'll see what we can do about that. Please, look, don't just see what you can do. Go in and threaten anybody that threatens to put that picture that they had on the video on the DVD. Tell them don't do it. They are basically killing the sale. All right, I will definitely let them know. I'm a much better looking guy than that. Looks oh. mighty ugly. All righty. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks again. Thank you. And have a great day. All right. All righty. Bye. Bye.